The wait is finally over. It's 8 p.m. Time to gather round and enjoy the feast Shalom World has prepared for you. 40 Martyrs of England and Wales. Margaret was now risking not just her freedom, but her life. Rewind with James Kilbane. Joyfully big. Family life, we get a glimpse of the heavenly kingdom. Beats. Jesus, my savior. Voyage, revelation. Vocare. Mixtape. Booked. OSV Talks. The choices we face. SW News. Unique, vibrant, and inspiring shows for all. Hang out on the couch and make the best of a night in. Starting August 15th, Monday to Friday, 8 to 10 p.m. Catch us daily on Shalom World. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Conley, the host for Shalom World's live coverage of Walking Together Pope Francis's Apostolic Journey to Canada. And we are now in day five of six days of Pope Francis's itinerary here in Canada. This morning he celebrated Mass at the National Shrine of St. Anne, a basilica just outside of Quebec City. And today, shortly, he will be celebrating or rather praying Vespers, an ancient prayer of the church with dozens, if not almost a hundred different seminarians, consecrated individuals, bishops and priests from across the Quebec diocese. So it'll be a prayer service that to cover the, continue, the continued intention of reconciliation that is at the heart of this journey. It's, it's going to be a beautiful prayer service. I, I'm looking forward to uh, watching the Holy Father lead this, this prayer, this time of prayer. Yes, most certainly. And, and for a bit of context for our viewers as to what Vespers is exactly, Vespers is the sixth of seven of the uh, what are called the Liturgy of the Hours, also known as the Divine Office, and formerly, but also in some circles, still called the Breviary, uh, which is a set of liturgical prayers that is required by canon law to be prayed by consecrated religious and priests as well throughout the day. It is considered by the church to be the second highest expression of liturgy, the highest form, of course, being the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which occurs daily on our altars. Uh, the Liturgy of the Hours is an opportunity and an occasion to extend the liturgy throughout the day, uh, as is said in the Psalms as well. Uh, I raise my prayer seven times a day to the Lord. And so the Liturgy of the Hours being seven set times throughout the day echoes uh, that call within the Psalms. It also roots back to even Jewish tradition as the Psalms were prayed uh, within the Jewish culture throughout the times of the day. And so even praying the Liturgy of the Hours is perhaps engaging in the same prayer that even our Lord would have prayed, as he too would have prayed the Psalms, um, as would have been common Jewish custom at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And so Pope Francis and uh, his priests, his bishops, and a number of consecrated religious are going to be fixating themselves into a, an ancient tradition, truly ancient tradition, 
Um, and in fact, this is something that Vatican II is asking even of the laity to engage in. There are many resources these mm -hmm. days for even yeah. lay people yeah. to, to engage in the Liturgy of the Hours. And so uh, highly encourage for our viewers to look into the Liturgy of the Hours mm -hmm. themselves if you're not familiar and to perhaps consider engaging in this wonderful form of universal prayer which happens throughout all hours in the day and is really done in unity with the church. Um, Vespers in particular comes from the Latin word Vesper, which means evening. Uh, most fittingly, it is the evening prayer of, of the liturgical prayers, the, of the Liturgy of the Hours. The morning and the evening prayer are seen as the hinge hours, the two most important sets of prayers. Uh, in the set of the Liturgy of the Hours. And so mm -hmm. it's an occasion to give thanks to the Lord for His graces in sustaining all those who had labored throughout the day and a prayer of petition right before everything wind down, winds down for the night time to just calm ourselves, ease our minds as we look to enter into rest at the close of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so beautifully exp explained. And it's also interesting to note that the Mass that was said at the National Shrine of St. Anne, uh, facilitated or rather presided over by Pope Francis himself, as well as Archbishop Gerard Lacroix, who is the Archbishop of Quebec, uh, the Mass was said with the special intention of reconciliation in the church, especially in regards to indigenous peoples of Canada. And so it, it struck me that as we uh, commence, as the Pope commences this prayer service of Vespers this evening, that intention will be carried through those prayers and lifted up to heaven with, a, with a, a, a hope that we will continue in this process of reconciliation and that we won't just... We won't just stop the process during this journey and during the time that the Pope is with, with us, that, that it will continue on far beyond uh, the short six days of Pope Francis's stay here in Canada, of course. The Cathedral Basilica of Notre Dame is the oldest church in Canada, and we're actually going to cut to a video here to give a little bit more context about the cathedral, its history, why it's so significant that the Pope is visiting, and some of the interesting facts about the history of the cathedral and how it's undergone some significant events, including some fires that have led to its renovation and continued uh, architectural enhancement over the years. Notre Dame de Quebec is the oldest church in Canada. The Basilica Cathedral is probably the most extensively expanded and transformed structure in Canada's history. Built in 1647, it was the city's first church to be made of stone. In 1664, it became the first parish church north of Mexico and was dedicated to Notre Dame of the Immaculate Conception. The beautiful cathedral was twice destroyed by fire in 1759 from an attack during the French and Indian War and in 1922 as a result of arson perpetrated by a local racist organization. Each time it was rebuilt and its beauty enhanced. To celebrate its 350th anniversary, a holy door was installed, only the second outside Europe and only the seventh in the world. Pope Pius IX declared Notre Dame de Quebec a basilica which is a church privileged because of the number of pilgrims it draws. What a beautiful history the cathedral has. It's so, so beautiful, and uh, it will be particularly poignant to watch the Vespers being celebrated at the cathedral tonight in light of knowing the history of this, of this very old church in Canada. It's the oldest church in Canada, right? Yes, it yeah. is the oldest church in Canada, built... Yeah, rather founded, its, its original structure mm -hmm. was built in 1647. It is the oldest, it is the oldest church north of Mexico. Yeah. Um, and as, as we've noted in previous programs, can really be seen as an ancestor of the church in Canada. Mm -hmm. Sort of the original church from which all churches in Canada have found uh, their fruition. Really, uh, similarly to our Lord saying that... Uh, he is the vine and the rest of us are the branches. The uh, Notre Dame de Quebec can be seen as the original source from which all the vines of the church and churches in Canada mm -hmm. have stemmed forth from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also interesting because during the same era that the Cathedral Basilica was originally established in those early 1600s, that was also the same era that St. Kateri Takakuitha 
was alive. She is the first North American indigenous saint to be canonized by a pope. And she also lived in the 1600s. And she spent the last five years of her life actually just in the Montreal area. So, so pretty close to where the Pope is right now. And she's been, of course, a figure that has been interceded to and has been revered throughout this entire pilgrimage um, that the Pope has been participating in here in Canada. She was, the again, the first canonized Indigenous person by the church. And she was known for the way that she suffered greatly in her life. She contracted smallpox as a child, which resulted in her losing much of her eyesight. And she also had um, a really difficult childhood with a lot of abuse and had her conversion later on when she encountered Jesuit missionaries that were coming to New France in the Canadian area and the New York State area where she grew up as a child. And her story is marked, of course, by a lot of suffering. It, it didn't really leave her um, for the entirety of her life. And I think that that beautifully corresponds with the themes of suffering and redemption and resurrection that have marked the entirety of this papal visit and the efforts of truth and reconciliation overall. The fact that there is suffering that we have to look straight in the eyes. It's unavoidable here on earth and certainly is a big part of the residential school legacy. But there's also this sense of the resurrection and hope, which St. Kateri was known to repeatedly speak about and have such faith in. She suffered so greatly in her life and yet she didn't lose sight of the coming glory and the fact that her wounds would be redeemed by our Lord. Um, I'm just I'm reminded again of the homily that Pope Francis offered at the Mass this morning, and he talked about how the church is wounded, the entire body of Christ is wounded by the wounds within our indigenous brothers and sisters and their history of suffering here in Canada. And once again, there's that sense of hope that we are all wounded, even if one of us is wounded, but we're all healed. We're all brought into healing when one of us or, or even part of us is healed. So... Uh, St. Kateri, I know she's interceding for this entire, this entire pilgrimage, this journey of Pope Francis, and uh, certainly as the first canonized indigenous saint, uh, it gives a, a beautiful witness to the, the bringing together, the connection between uh, the beauty of our indigenous heritage and families here in Canada, as well as the Catholic faith being brought together, right? Most, most definitely. Yeah. Uh, she is a, a beautiful witness, and such a delight that we have such a variety of saints. And mm -hmm. interestingly, each of the saints, we, we should be reminded, in fact, each of us are, are made in the image and likeness of God. Each of us display and bring forth to the world an image of God, which is wholly unique, but in and of the same, wholly representative of the the infinite wonder and joy of the Lord. And, and St. Kateri is, is no exception. In fact, she's a shining example uh, for those that are, are seeking someone who is, is more like them, someone who has uh, had a similar pathway, a similar walk in life, and really need an encouragement. Jenny, do you want to remind us, I guess, of mm -hmm. what her last name uh, is re in reference oh, yeah. to? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were. Ju we, I just learned this this morning. Her last name, Tekakwitha, is an Iroquois word, and it actually means... Uh, she who proceeds without hesitation or she who moves forward without hesitation. And I thought that was really interesting because um, based on what I've been reading about St. Kateri, that name came from the fact that when she lost her eyesight, she still kept moving forward with this boldness and this, this being compelled forward into the future, into her calling as a saint and as a follower of Christ. Which again, I mean, there's, I, I love how many themes are so beautifully connected in the entirety of this papal visit. But certainly, Tekakwitha, she who moves forward in boldness, is, it reminds us of that sense of moving forward into the future. Moving forward into a future of healing and hope and reconciliation, despite the suffering of the past, which Kateri was all too familiar with, with the loss of sight at such, or at least the loss of most of her sight at such an early age. So yeah, it's a good reminder. Tekakwitha uh, is such a beautiful, is such a beautiful word. 
We were also learning really interestingly enough, and it's something worth noting and kind of watching out for while you're watching the coverage of Vespers today at the cathedral, that there are the relics of many different, I think over 13 different canonized Canadian saints, or at least saints who had their origins in Canada. These relics are preserved at the cathedral, and there'll be at least one moment where the Pope will be uh, honoring the relics of Saint Francois de Laval, who is actually uh, ordained, or pardon me, it was canonized by Pope Francis himself in 2016. And Saint Francois, again, just ordained freshly in 2016, was the first Bishop of Canada. And he is known for his harmonious and peaceful and, and welcoming connection with the indigenous peoples of Canada while he was a missionary. So an interesting, an interesting thing to look forward to and kind of pay attention to uh, near the end of Vespers when the Pope will be pointing out uh, Saint Francois, his relics, and the relics of 13 or more different saints who all have their origins in Canada. So it, It's a glorious thing. <laughs> yes, the, uh, the saints, when they leave us, I guess they're not ever really too far away from us as, as the relics in this mm -hmm. basilica. Uh, remind us of another thing for all of us to look out for are the holy doors which are right. present at the uh, cathedral um, holy doors for those unfamiliar are a particular set of doors issued by the vatican out to certain uh, churches throughout the world in which are opened at ceremonial times perhaps once every 25 years or so whenever a jubilee occasion occurs at which time, when they are opened, the lay faithful, when they pass through it, gain a plenary indulgence by their passing. There are only seven holy doors in existence throughout the world, one of them being St. Peter's Basilica, mm -hmm. three of them in Rome, uh, another one placed within France at uh, a church that is referencing the cure of ours, St. Uh, Vianney, another in the Philippines, and the only one in North America is that of here at the Notre Dame de Quebec. So a very important uh, building structure for the church, particularly signified by these holy doors. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of holy doors and the fact that there's been much discussion about how walking together this apostolic journey of Pope Francis is opening a new door, a new era in the Canadian Catholic Church. I mean, also the church at large, but specifically opening a new era of connection and healing in the Canadian church. And that's been uh, repeatedly reiterated for me as I've watched the coverage and attended some of the alive events of this papal visit. There's a sense of of, of bringing in a new sense of family, seeing the different cultures and people that are working together on this papal visit. Obviously, even logistically, a papal visit is a massive undertaking uh, for church, government, and all of the thousands of volunteers who have offered their time to this papal visit all over Canada. And uh, even just practically speaking, people have to work together to be able to make this work, whether it goes down to the details of papal security or whether it goes down to the details of making the vestments for the Pope. There's been a lot of indigenous artists that have made vestments for the Pope. There was an indigenous artist from the west coast of Canada that made the vestments for the Commonwealth Stadium Mass for the Pope. And as well as the Mass that was celebrated this morning at the National Shrine of St. Anne, the vestments once again were part of the work of an indigenous artist and so all of these details they come together people who may never otherwise closely interact catholics that may not know one another's stories are being brought together by this event um, and many of whom may not even actually personally interact with the pope but we're interacting with one another and that just gives me such a sense of hope for that a new door in the canadian church bringing people together and which is essential to dialogue essential to the spirit of listening that has categorized pope francis's papacy and of course uh, the church is currently in the midst of a synod and the church just uh finished the listening session part of that synod, which is Pope Francis's call 
to everyone in the church to listen to one another, to exchange stories. And through that collection of stories and mutual sharing, we can move forward into uh, a new era of a new era, pardon me, uh, of the Holy Catholic Church. So I think that that hopefully as people walk through the doors physically today at the Cathedral, uh, Cathedral Basilica in Quebec City, but also walk through the spiritual doors of this pilgrimage, that there will be a new era and that we will continue to listen and exchange stories. So yeah, it promises to be a beautiful new, new place in the Canadian church. So we're going to be switching to the live coverage of Pope Francis praying Vespers with consecrated persons, bishops and priests from all over the Canadian Quebec church. And once again, I'm Jenny Conley, the host for Shalom World's live coverage of Walking Together, Pope Francis's apostolic journey to Canada. I'm here with David Haleva and we'll see you after the live stream. De tous mes frères évêques, votre réponse positive à notre invitation et votre présence ici aujourd'hui à Québec sont pour nous un témoignage d'affection très apprécié. Cette visitation à l'intention de l'Église catholique au Canada s'inscrit dans le contexte d'une réconciliation avec nos sœurs et nos frères autochtones. Déjà, quelques-uns d'entre vous vous ont rencontré à Rome avec les délégations issues des Premières Nations, des Métis et des Inuits venus vous rendre visite près du siège de Saint-Pierre. À votre tour, votre voyage ici élargit ce chemin de réconciliation à la mesure de tous les habitants de chez nous. Votre seule présence est déjà promesse d'alliance, engagement à marcher ensemble pour habiter fraternellement une terre commune. Votre présence est un appui à vos frères évêques, à leurs collaborateurs et collaboratrices dans les efforts. With great joy and profound gratitude, I greet your... Holiness in Canada, in the name of all my brother bishops, your res positive response to our invitation and your presence here in Quebec are a witness of your affection. This visitation to the Church in Canada comes within the context of reconciliation with our sisters and brothers who are Indigenous. You've already been able to visit the delegation of First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who came to visit you in your own Sea of Peter. In your turn, your voyage here is a broader form of reconciliation that embraces all of the inhabitants of our country. Your presence is already a promise of a covenant, a commitment to walk together, to live fraternally on a common land. Your coming among us is a support to your brother bishops and to all the collaborators. In the Gospel, Elizabeth recognizes the Mother of God when Mary visits her. In you, Holy Father, we recognize the Lord's mercy that is offered to us. We know well that your presence means great physical effort and personal effort for you. And we know also that the, the meetings that you've experienced are an expression of a mutual effort to sustain this walking together and to open new horizons in our communities. These words from Bishop Raymond Poisson, the President of the Episcopal Conference of Canada. Uh, Vespers this evening come from the Common of Pastors in honor of the first Bishop of Quebec, Francis de Laval.
life is at the service of the gospel, God has given me this gift of his grace. And the choir now chanting Psalm 15. Second Psalm, Psalm 112. Yeah. <laughs> 
and now the chant of the canticle from Revelation. Je m'adresse à tous ceux qui exercent parmi vous la To the elders among you, I, a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering and sharer in the glory that is to be revealed, make this appeal. Soyez les bergers du troupeau de Dieu qui vous est. God's flock is in your midst. Give it a shepherd's care. Watch over it willingly, as God would have you do, not under constraint, and not for shameful profit either, but generously. Be examples to the flock, not lording, over, not lording it over those assigned to you, so that when the chief shepherd appears, you will win for yourselves the unfading, unfading crown of glory. And the Holy Father will now provide his discourse right now. Queridos hermanos obispos, queridos sacerdotes y diáconos, consagradas, consagrados, seminaristas, agentes pastorales, buenas tardes. Agradezco a Monseñor Poisson la palabra de bienvenida que me ha dirigido. Los saludo a todos ustedes, especialmente a los que tuvieron que recorrer un camino largo para poder llegar. Las distancias en vuestro país son realmente enormes. Por eso, gracias. Estoy contento de encontrarme con ustedes. Dear Brother Bishops, Dear priests and deacons, consecrated men and women, seminarians and pastoral workers, good evening. I thank Bishop Poisson for his words of welcome, and I greet all of you, especially those who had to travel a long way to get here. The distances in your country are truly large. Thank you. I am happy to be here with you. Es significativo que nos encontremos en la Basílica de Notre Dame de Quebec, catedral de esta iglesia particular, sede primada del Canadá, cuyo primer obispo, San François de Laval, abrió el seminario en 1663 y durante todo su ministerio 
se dedicó a la formación de sacerdotes. De los ancianos, es decir, de los presbíteros, nos habló la lectura breve que hemos escuchado. San Pedro nos ha exhortado a paciente en el rebaño de Dios que les ha sido confiado, velen por él, no forzada, sino espontáneamente. Mientras estamos aquí reunidos como pueblo de Dios, recordemos que Jesús es el pastor de nuestra vida, que cuida de nosotros porque nos ama verdaderamente. A nosotros, pastores de la Iglesia, se nos pide esa misma generosidad para presentar el rebaño, para que pueda manifestarse la solicitud de Jesús por todos y su compasión por las heridas de cada uno. It is significant that we find ourselves in the Basilica of Notre Dame de Quebec, the cathedral of this particular church and primatial see of Canada, whose first bishop, Saint Francois de Laval, opened the seminary in 1663 and devoted his entire ministry to the formation of priests. The brief reading that we have heard spoke to us about the elders, that is, the presbyters. St. Peter urged us, tend the, flock of, tend the flock of God, that is your charge, not by constraint, but willingly. Gathered here as the people of God, Let us remember that Jesus is the shepherd of our lives, who cares for us because he truly loves us. We, the church's pastors, are asked to show that same generosity in tending the flock in order to manifest Jesus' concern for everyone and his compassion for the wounds of each. Y precisamente porque somos signos de Cristo, el apóstol Pedro nos exhorta a paciente en el rebaño, guíenlo, no dejen que se pierda mientras ustedes se ocupan de los propios asuntos. Cuídenlo con dedicación y ternura, y agrega, háganlo espontáneamente, no de manera forzada, no como un deber no como religiosos asalariados o funcionarios de lo sagrado, sino con corazón de pastores, con entusiasmo. Si nosotros lo miramos a él, buen pastor, antes que a nosotros mismos, descubriremos que estamos custodiados con ternura y sentiremos la cercanía de Dios. De aquí nace la alegría del ministerio y antes aún la alegría de la fe, no de ver lo que nosotros somos capaces de hacer, sino de saber que Dios está cerca, que nos amó primero y nos acompaña cada día. Precisely because we are a sign of Christ, the Apostle Peter urges us to tend the flock, to guide it, to not to let it go astray while busy about our own affairs. Care for it with devotion and tender love. Peter tells us to do this willingly, not perforce, not as a duty, not as professional religious personnel, sacred officials, but zealously and with the heart of a shepherd. If we look to Christ, the Good Shepherd, before looking to ourselves, we will discover that we ourselves tend are tended with merciful love. We feel the closeness of God. This is the source of the joy of ministry and above all, the joy of faith. It is not about all the things that we can accomplish, but about knowing that God is ever close to us, that he loved us first, and that he accompanies us every day of our lives. Esta, hermanos y hermanas, es nuestra alegría. No es una alegría fácil. 
esa que a menudo nos propone el mundo, ilusionándonos con fuegos artificiales. Esta alegría no está ligada a riquezas y seguridades, tampoco está ligada a la persuasión de que en la vida nos irá siempre bien, sin cruces ni problemas. La alegría cristiana, en cambio, está unida a una experiencia de paz que permanece en el corazón, incluso cuando estamos rodeados de pruebas y aflicciones, porque sabemos que no estamos solos, sino acompañados de un Dios que no es indiferente a nuestra suerte. Así como cuando el mar está agitado, que en la superficie aparece turbulento y en la profundidad permanece sereno y tranquilo. Esta es la alegría cristiana, un don gratuito, la certeza de sabernos amados, sostenidos, abrazados por Cristo en cada situación de la vida. Porque es Él quien nos libera del egoísmo y del pecado, de la tristeza y de la soledad, del vacío interior y del miedo, dándonos una mirada nueva de la vida, una mirada nueva de la historia. Con Jesucristo siempre nace y renace la alegría. This, brothers and sisters, is our joy. Nor is it a cheap joy, like the one that the world sometimes proposes, dazzling us with fireworks. It is not about wealth, comfort, or security. It does not even try to persuade us that life will always be good without crosses and problems. Christian joy is about the experience of a peace that remains in our hearts, even when we are pelted by trials and afflictions. For then we know that we are not alone, but accompanied by a God who is not indifferent to our lot. When seas are rough, the storm is always on the surface, but the depths remain calm and peaceful. This is also true of Christian joy. It is a free gift, the certainty of knowing that we are loved, sustained, and embraced by Christ in every situation in life. He is the one who frees us from selfishness and sin, from the sadness of solitude, from inner emptiness and fear, and gives us a new look at life and history. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. Entonces, sí, podemos preguntarnos, ¿cómo va nuestra alegría? ¿Cómo va mi alegría? ¿Nuestra iglesia expresa la alegría del Evangelio en nuestras comunidades? ¿Hay una fe que atrae por la alegría que comunica? Si queremos afrontar estas cuestiones en su raíz, no podemos menos que reflexionar sobre aquello que en la realidad de nuestro tiempo hace peligrar la alegría de la fe y amenaza con oscurecerla, poniendo seriamente en crisis la experiencia cristiana. Pensamos entonces inmediatamente en la secularización que desde hace tiempo ha transformado el estilo de vida de las mujeres y de los hombres de hoy, dejando a Dios casi en el trasfondo, como desaparecido del horizonte. Pareciera que su palabra ya no es una brújula de orientación para la vida, para las opciones fundamentales, para las relaciones humanas y sociales. Pero debemos hacer rápidamente una aclaración cuando observamos la cultura en la que estamos inmersos, sus lenguajes y sus símbolos, es necesario atentos a no quedar prisioneros del pesimismo, no quedar prisioneros del resentimiento, dejándonos llevar por juicios negativos o nostalgias inútiles. Hay en efecto dos miradas posibles respecto al mundo en que vivimos. Una la llamaría mirada negativa, y la otra mirada que disierne. Nous pouvons donc nous demander comment se porte notre joie. So let us ask ourselves a question. What are we doing 
how am I doing when it comes to joy? Does our church express the joy of the gospel? Is there a faith in our communities that can attract by the joy it communicates? If we want to go to the root of these questions, we need to reflect on what it is that in today's world, threatens the joy of faith and thus risks diminishing it and compromising our lives as Christians. We can immediately think of secularization, which has greatly affected the style of life of contemporary men and women, relegating God, as it were, to the background. God seems to have disappeared from the horizon, and his word no longer seems a compass guiding our lives, our basic decisions, our human and social relationships. Yet, we should be clear about one thing. When we consider the culture in which we are immersed and its variety of languages and, and symbols, we must be careful not to fall prey to pessimism or resentment, passing immediately to negative judgments or a vain nostalgia. There are two possible views we can have towards the world in which we live. I would call one the negative view, and the other the discerning view. Acusa la realidad con amargura, diciendo el mundo es malo, reina el pecado. Y así corre el peligro de revestirse de un espíritu de cruzada. Prestemos atención a esto, porque no es cristiano. De hecho, no es el modo de obrar de Dios, el cual, nos recuerda el Evangelio, amó tanto al mundo que entregó a su Hijo único, para que todo el que cree en él no muera, sino que tenga vida eterna. El Señor, que detesta la mundanidad, tiene una mirada, una mirada buena sobre el mundo. Detesta la mundanidad y tiene una mirada buena sobre el mundo. Él bendice nuestra vida, dice bien de nosotros y de nuestra realidad. Se encarnan las situaciones de la historia, no para condenar, sino para hacer brotar la semilla del reino, precisamente ahí donde parecería que triunfan las tinieblas. Si nos detenemos en una mirada negativa, por el contrario, acabaremos por negar la encarnación, porque más que encarnarnos en la realidad, huiremos de ella. Nos cerraremos en nosotros mismos, lloraremos nuestras pérdidas, nos lamentaremos continuamente y caeremos en la tristeza y en el pesimismo. Tristeza y pesimismo nunca vienen de Dios. En cambio, estamos llamados a tener una mirada semejante a la de Dios, que sabe distinguir entre el bien y se obstina en buscarlo, en verlo y alimentarlo. No es una mirada ingenua, sino una mirada que disierne la realidad. Le premier, le regard negatif. The first, the negative view, is often born of a faith that feels under attack and thinks of it as a kind of armor defending us against the world. This view bitterly complains that the world is evil, that sin reigns, and thus risks clothing itself in a crusading spirit. We need to be careful because this is not Christian. It is not, in fact, the way of God, who, as the Gospel reminds us, so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Lord, who detests worldliness, has a positive view of the world. He blesses our life, speaks well of us in our situation, and makes himself incarnate in historical situations 
not to condemn, but to give growth to the seed of the kingdom in those places where darkness seems to triumph. If we are limited to a negative view, we will end up denying the incarnation. We will flee from reality rather than making it incarnate in us. We will close in on ourselves, lament our losses, constantly complain, and fall into gloom and pessimism. Gloom and pessimism, which never come from God. We are called instead to have a view similar to that of God, who discerns what is good and persistently seeks it, sees it, and nurtures it. This is no naive view, but a view that discerns reality. Para afinar nuestro discernimiento sobre el mundo secularizado, dejémonos inspirar por lo que escribió San Pablo VI, Evangelio Inunciandi, esa exhortación apostólica que todavía hoy tiene vigencia. Para él, la secularización es un esfuerzo en sí mismo justo, legítimo, no incompatible con la fe y la religión, para descubrir las leyes de la realidad y de la misma vida humana dadas por el Creador. Dios, en efecto, no nos quiere esclavos, sino hijos. No quiere decidir en nuestro lugar ni oprimirnos con un poder sagrado en un mundo gobernado por leyes religiosas. No. Él nos ha creado libres y nos pide que seamos personas adultas, personas responsables en la vida y en la sociedad. Otra cosa distinguía San Pablo VI es el secularismo, una concepción de vida que separa totalmente del vínculo con el Creador, de modo que se vuelve superfluo y hasta un obstáculo y se generan nuevas formas de ateísmo, sutiles y variadas, una civilización del consumo, el hedonismo, erigido en valor supremo, una voluntad de poder y de dominio, de discriminaciones de todo género. A nosotros, como Iglesia, sobre todo como pastores del pueblo de Dios, como pastores, como consagradas, como consagrados, como seminaristas y como agentes de pastoral, a todos nosotros nos toca saber hacer estas distinciones, discernir. Si cedemos a la mirada negativa y juzgamos de modo superficial, corremos el riesgo de transmitir un mensaje equivocado, como si detrás de la crítica sobre la secularización estuviera, por parte nuestra, la nostalgia de un mudo sacralizado, de una sociedad de otros tiempos, en la que la Iglesia y sus ministros tenían más poder y relevancia social. Y esta es una perspectiva equivocada. Para afinar nuestro discernimiento sobre el mundo secularizado, dejémonos inspirar de San Pablo VI, de Evangelio Nunciandi, from his apostolic exhortation, which is still relevant today, who saw secularization as the effort in itself just and legitimate and in no way incompatible with faith or religion. To discover the laws governing reality and human life implanted by the Creator, God does not want us to be slaves, but sons and daughters. He does not want to make decisions for us or oppress us with a sacral power exercised in a world governed by religious laws. No, he created us to be free, and he asks us to be mature and responsible persons in life and in society. 
St. Paul VI distinguished secularization from secularism, a concept of life that totally separates a link with the Creator so that God becomes superfluous and an encumbrance and generates subtle and diverse new forms of atheism, a consumer society, the pursuit of pleasure set up as the supreme value, a desire for power and domination and discrimination of every kind. We, as church, and above all as shepherds of God's people and as consecrated persons, deacons, seminarians, and pastoral workers, it is up to us to make these distinctions, to make this discernment. If we yield to the negative view and judge matters superficially, we risk sending the wrong message, as though the criticism of secularization masks on our part the nostalgia for a sacralized world, a bygone society in which the church and her ministers had greater power and social relevance. And this is a mistaken way of seeing things. Como advierte un gran estudioso de estos temas, el problema de la secularización para nosotros cristianos no debe ser la menor relevancia social de la Iglesia o la pérdida de riquezas materiales y privilegios. Más bien, esta nos pide que reflexionemos sobre los cambios de la sociedad que han influido en el modo en que las personas piensan y organizan la vida. Si nos detenemos en este aspecto, nos damos cuenta de que no es la fe la que está en crisis, sino ciertas formas y modos con los que anunciamos. Por eso la secularización es un desafío a nuestra imaginación pastoral. Es la oportunidad para recomponer la vida espiritual en nuevas formas y también para nuevas formas de existir. De este modo, mientras la mirada que disierne nos hace ver las dificultades que tenemos en transmitir la alegría de la fe, a la vez nos estimula a volver a encontrar una nueva pasión por la evangelización, a buscar nuevos lenguajes, a cambiar algunas prioridades pastorales e ir a lo esencial. Au contraire, comme le fait remarquer un gran spécialiste de ces questions, Instead, as one of the great scholars of our time has observed, the real issue of secularization for us Christians should not be the diminished social relevance of the church or the loss of material wealth and privileges. Rather, secularization demands that we reflect on the changes in society that have influenced the way in which people think about and organize their lives. If we consider this aspect of the question, we come to realize that what is in crisis is not the faith, but some of the forms and ways in which we present it. Consequently, secularization represents a challenge for our pastoral imagination. It is, quote, an occasion for restructuring the spiritual life in new forms and for new ways of existing, unquote, from Charles Taylor, A Secular Age. In this way, a discerning view, while acknowledging the difficulties we face in communicating the joy of the faith, motivates us to develop a new passion for evangelization, to look for new languages and forms of expression, to change certain pastoral priorities and to focus on the essentials. Necesitamos anunciar el Evangelio para dar a los hombres y a las mujeres de hoy la alegría de la fe. Pero este anuncio no se hace principalmente con palabras, sino por medio de un testimonio rebosante de amor gratuito, tal como Dios lo hace con nosotros. Es un anuncio que pide encarnarse en un estilo de vida personal, eclesial, que pueda reavivar el deseo del Señor infundir esperanza, transmitir confianza y credibilidad. Y 
Y sobre esto me permito, en espíritu fraterno, proponerles tres desafíos que ustedes podrán llevar adelante en la oración y en el servicio pastoral. Chers frères et sœurs, il est nécessaire de proclamer les Dear brothers and sisters, the gospel needs to be proclaimed if we are to communicate the joy of faith to today's men and women. Yet, this proclamation is not primarily a matter of words, but of a witness abounding with gratuitous love, for that is God's way with us. A proclamation that should take shape in a personal and ecclesial lifestyle that can rekindle a desire for the Lord, instill hope, and radiate trust and credibility. Here, in a spirit of fraternity, allow me to suggest three challenges that can shape your prayer and pastoral service. El primero de los desafíos, dar a conocer a Jesús. En los desiertos espirituales de nuestro tiempo, generados por el secularismo y la indiferencia, es necesario volver al primer anuncio. Lo repito, es necesario volver al primer anuncio. No podemos presumir de comunicar la alegría de la fe presentando aspectos secundarios a quienes todavía no han abrazado al Señor en sus vidas, o bien solo repitiendo ciertas prácticas o reproduciendo formas pastorales del pasado. Es necesario encontrar nuevos caminos para anunciar el corazón del Evangelio a cuantos todavía no han encontrado a Cristo. Y esto presupone una creatividad pastoral para llegar a las personas allá donde viven, no esperando que vengan, allá donde viven, descubriendo ocasiones de escucha, de diálogo, de encuentro. Es necesario volver a lo esencial, es necesario volver al entusiasmo de los hechos de los apóstoles y a la belleza de sentirnos instrumento de la fecundidad del Espíritu hoy. Es necesario volver a Galilea. Es la cita de Jesús resucitado que vayan a Galilea, para, permítaseme la palabra, recomenzar después del fracaso. Volver a Galilea, y cada uno de nosotros tiene su propia Galilea, la del primer anuncio, recuperar esa memoria. Le premier défi, faire connaître Jésus. Dans les déserts spirituels de notre temps, générés par la, le sécularisme et l'indifférence, le premier défi est de faire Jésus connaître. Dans les déserts spirituels de notre temps, créés par le sécularisme et l'indifférence, il est nécessaire de revenir à la première proclamation. Je répète, il est nécessaire de revenir à la première proclamation. We cannot presume to communicate the joy of faith by presenting secondary aspects to those who have not yet embraced the Lord in their lives, or by simply repeating certain practices or replicating older forms of pastoral work. We must find new ways to proclaim the heart of the gospel to those who have not yet encountered Christ. This calls for a pastoral creativity capable of reaching people where they are living, not that they come to us, where they are living, finding opportunities for listening, dialogue, and encounter. We need to return to the simplicity and enthusiasm of the Acts of the Apostles, to the beauty of realizing that we are instruments of the Spirit's fruitfulness today. It is necessary to return to Galilee to meet the risen Lord Revenir en Galilée, to return to Galilee, après l'échec. Chacun, and each one of us, 
has his or her own Galilee of the first proclamation, the first encounter. We need to recuperate that memory. El Evangelio se anuncia de modo eficaz cuando la vida es la que habla, la que revela esa libertad que hace libre a los demás, esa compasión que no pide nada a cambio, esa misericordia que habla de Cristo sin palabras. La Iglesia en Canadá, después de haber sido herida y desolada por el mal que perpetraron algunos de sus hijos, ha comenzado un nuevo camino. Pienso en particular en los abusos sexuales cometidos contra menores y personas vulnerables, crímenes que requieren acciones fuertes y una lucha irreversible. Yo quisiera, junto con ustedes, pedir nuevamente perdón a todas las víctimas. El dolor y la vergüenza que experimentamos debe ser ocasión de conversión, nunca más. Y pensando en el camino de sanación y reconciliación con los hermanos y las hermanas indígenas, que la comunidad cristiana no se deje contaminar nunca más por la idea de que existe una cultura superior a otras y que es legítimo usar medios de coacción contra los demás. Recuperemos el ardor misionero de vuestro primer obispo, San François de Laval, que se enfrentó contra todos los que degradaban a los indígenas, induciéndolos a consumir bebidas para engañarlos. No permitamos que ninguna ideología enajene y confunda los estilos y las formas de vida de nuestros pueblos para intentar doblegarlos y dominarlos. Que los nuevos progresos de la humanidad sean asimilables en su identidad cultural con la clave de la cultura. Mais pour annoncer l'évangile, il faut être crédible. Voici le second défi. In order to le proclaim the gospel, however, we must also be credible. Here is the second challenge, witness. The gospel is preached effectively when life itself speaks and reveals the freedom that sets others free, the compassion that asks for nothing in return, the mercy that speaks of Christ without using words. The Church in Canada has set out on a new path after being hurt and devastated by the evil perpetrated by some of its sons and daughters. I think in particular of the sexual abuse of minors and vulnerable people crimes that require firm action and an irreversible commitment. Together with you, I would like once more to ask forgiveness of all the victims. The pain and the shame we feel must become an occasion for conversion never again. And thinking about the process of healing and reconciliation with our indigenous brothers and sisters, never again can the Christian community allow itself to be infected by the idea that one culture is superior to others or that it is legitimate to employ ways of coercing others. Let us recover the missionary zeal of your first bishop, St. Francois de Laval, who railed against those who demeaned the indigenous people by inducing them to imbibe strong drink in order then to cheat them. Let us not allow any ideolo ideology to alienate or mislead the customs and ways of life of our people as a means of subduing them or controlling them. Pero 
Pero para acabar con esta cultura de la exclusión, es necesario que empecemos nosotros, los pastores, que no se sientan superiores a los hermanos y a las hermanas del pueblo de Dios. No. Que los consagrados vivan la fraternidad y la libertad de la obediencia en comunidad. Los seminaristas que se dispongan a ser servidores dóciles y disponibles y los agentes pastorales no conciban su servicio como poder. Se empieza desde aquí. Ustedes son los protagonistas y los constructores de una iglesia diferente, humilde, afable, misericordiosa. Una iglesia que acompaña los procesos, que trabaja decidida y serenamente en la inculturación, que valora a cada uno y a cada diversidad cultural y religiosa. Demos este testimonio. Mais pour en finir avec cette culture de l'exclusion, in order to defeat this culture of exclusion, we must begin with ourselves, pastors, who should not feel themselves superior to their brothers and sisters in the people of God. That consecrated persons live fraternally in with the the freedom of obedience in life and community. That seminarians prepare themselves to become docile servants, docile and available servants, and that pastoral workers who should not understand service as power, this is where we must start. You are key figures and builders of a different church, humble meek, merciful, a church that accompanies processes, labors decisively and serenely in the culture, in the service of inculturation, that shows respect for each individual and for every cultural and religious difference. Let us offer this witness. Por último, el tercer desafío, la fraternidad. Primero, dar a conocer a Jesús. Segundo, el testimonio. Tercero, la fraternidad. La Iglesia será testigo creíble del Evangelio cuando sus miembros vivan más la comunión, creando ocasiones y espacios para que quienes se acerquen a la fe encuentren una comunidad acogedora, que sabe escuchar, que sabe entrar en diálogo que promueve un buen nivel de relaciones. Así decía vuestro santo obispo a los misioneros. A menudo una palabra amarga, una falta de paciencia, un rostro que rechaza, destruirán en un momento lo que se había construido en mucho tiempo. Enfin, le troisième défi. Finally, the third challenge, fraternity. Le premier défi, the first challenge, to make known to make Christ known, the second witness, the third fraternity. The church will be a credible witness to the gospel the more its members embody communion, creating opportunities and situations that enable all those who approach the faith to encounter a welcoming community, one capable of listening and entering into dialogue and promoting quality relationships. This is what Saint Francois de Laval told the missionaries. Often, a word of bitterness, an impatient gesture, an irksome look will destroy in a moment what had taken a long time to accomplish. Se trata de vivir una comunidad cristiana que se convierte de este modo en escuela de humanidad donde aprender a quererse como hermanos y hermanas, dispuestos a trabajar juntos por el bien común. De hecho, en el centro del anuncio evangélico está el amor de Dios que transforma y hace capaces de comunión con todos y de servicio hasta todos. Un teólogo de esta tierra escribió, el amor que Dios nos da desborda en un amor que es el que impulsa al buen samaritano a detenerse y hacerse cargo del viajero asaltado por los ladrones. Es un amor que no tiene fronteras, que busca el reino de Dios, que es universal. Fin de la cita. La Iglesia 
está llamada a encarnar este amor sin fronteras para construir el sueño que Dios tiene para la humanidad, que todos seamos hermanos. Preguntémonos, ¿cómo va la fraternidad entre nosotros? Los obispos entre ellos, los obispos con los sacerdotes, los sacerdotes entre ellos, los sacerdotes con el pueblo de Dios. ¿Somos hermanos o rivales divididos en partidos? ¿Y cómo están nuestras relaciones con los que no son de los nuestros? con los que no creen, con los que tienen tradiciones y costumbres diferentes. Este es el camino, promover relaciones de fraternidad con todos, con los hermanos y las hermanas indígenas, con cada hermana y hermano que encontramos, porque en el rostro de cada uno se refleja la presencia de Dios. Il s'agit de vivre une communauté chrétienne. We are talking about living in a Christian community that in this way becomes a school of humanity where all can learn to love one another as brothers and sisters, ready to work together for the common good. Indeed, at the heart of the preaching of the gospel is God's love, which transforms us and makes us capable of communion with all and service to all. As a Canadian theologian has written, the love that God gives us overflows into love. It is a love that prompts the Good Samaritan to stop and take care of the traveler attacked by thieves. It is a love that has no borders, that seeks the kingdom of God, and this kingdom is universal. That's a quote from Bernard Lonergan. The church is called to embody this love without borders in order to realize the dream that God, that God has for humanity, for us to be brothers and sisters. Let us ask ourselves, how are we doing when it comes to practical fraternity among us, bishops among themselves, bishops with their priests, priests among themselves and with the people of God? Are we brothers or competitors split into parties? And how about our relationships with those who are not one of our own, with those who do not believe, with those who have different traditions and customs? This is the way to build relationships of fraternity with everyone, with indigenous brothers and sisters, with every sister and brother we meet, because the presence of God is reflected in each of their faces. Estos son, queridos hermanos y hermanas, solamente algunos desafíos. No olvidemos que solo podemos llevarlos adelante con la fuerza del Espíritu que siempre debemos invocar en la oración. Pero no dejemos entrar en nosotros el espíritu del secularismo, pensando que podemos crear proyectos que funcionan por sí mismos y solo con las fuerzas humanas sin Dios. Es una idolatría esta, la idolatría de los proyectos sin Dios. Y por favor, no nos encerremos en el retroceso, Sigamos adelante con alegría. Pongamos en práctica estas palabras que dirigimos a San François de Laval. Tú fuiste el hombre del compartir, visitando a los enfermos, vistiendo a los pobres, combatiendo por la dignidad de los pueblos originarios, sosteniendo a los misioneros cansados, siempre pronto a tender la mano a los que estaban peor que tú. Cuántas veces tus proyectos fueron destrozados, pero siempre tú los pusiste de nuevo en pie. Tú habías entendido que la obra de Dios no es de piedra y que en esta tierra de desánimo era necesario un constructor de esperanza. Les agradezco todo lo que hacen. Los bendigo de corazón. Y por favor, sigan rezando por mí. These are just a few of the challenges. Let us not forget 
that we these brothers and sisters are just a few of the, of the Spirit, whom we must always invoke in prayer. Let us not allow the spirit of secularism to enter our midst, thinking that we can create plans that work automatically and by human effort alone, apart from God, in the idol idolatry of projects. And please, let us not close ourselves off by looking back. Let us press forward with joy. Mettons en pratique ces paroles que nous adressons à Saint François. Let us put into practice these words that we now address. From Saint François de Laval. Or we address to Saint François de Laval. You were a man for others who visited the sick, clothed the poor, defended the dignity of original peoples, supported the strenuous efforts of the missionaries, ever ready to reach out a hand to those worse off than yourself. How many times were your projects frustrated? Each time, however, you took them up again. You understood that God does not build in stone, and that in this land of discouragement there was a need for a builder of hope. I thank you for everything you do, and I bless you from my heart. Please continue to pray for me. participating here now up on their feet <laughs> Holy Father smiling and receiving their applause Turn to the praying of Vespers with the responsory. Again, we're following the common of pastors evening prayer here in the Cathedral of. Notre Dame in Quebec. We heard the Holy Father mention St. Francis de Laval. His tomb is in this cathedral, along with the relics of 18 additional saints who've originated from Canada. Watch over yourselves and over the entire flock. Blessed the servant who is vigilant, he will enter into the joy of his master. Now 
lead the Church of God acquired through the blood of His Son. Bless the servant who is vigilant. He will enter into the joy of his master. singing of the Gospel Canticle, the Magnificat.
Jesus Christ is worthy of all praise, for he was appointed high priest among men and their representative before God. We honor him, and in our weakness we pray. You marvelously illuminated your church through distinguished leaders and holy men and women. Let Christians rejoice always in such splendor. You forgave the sins of your people when their holy leaders, like Moses, sought your compassion. Through their intercession, continue to purify and sanctify your holy people. In the midst of, your, of their brothers and sisters, you anointed your holy ones and filled them with the Holy Spirit. Fill all the leaders of your people with the same spirit. You yourself are the only visible possession of our holy pastors. Let none of them, one at the price of your blood, remain far from you. The shepherds of your church keep your flock from being snatched out of your hand. Through them, you give your flock eternal life. Save those who have died, those for whom you gave up your life. And now will we, we will be invited to pray the Lord's Prayer. O oh God, you sent the Holy Bishop François de Laval to extend the kingdom of Christ in Canada. Through his intercession, grant us the grace of fulfilling the missionary work to which we are called as disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. And now the Holy Father will grant his apostolic blessing. Dominus obiscum. Et Sin nomen Domini benedictum. Et sopum et suetis seculum. Aiutorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Benedicta vos, omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Bénissons le Seigneur. This now brings to a conclusion the recitation of Vespers here with the Holy Father in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Quebec. 
the the program does show that um, the Cardinal Archbishop of Quebec, Cardinal Gerald Lacroix, will bring the Holy Father to visit the tomb of St. Francis de Laval, where the other relics of the other Canadian saints will also be exposed. beautiful music that we've been hearing comes from St. Michael's Choir School of Toronto, especially some assembled for this celebration. And with this beautiful music, we bring this live broadcast from the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Quebec where the Pope has presided over Vespers with the bishops, priests, consecrated men and women, seminarians, and pastoral workers on this fifth day of his 37th apostolic journey to Canada. From here, Pope Francis will be driven to the Archbishop's residence and will dine in private. Tomorrow morning, Pope Francis will celebrate Holy Mass also in private and will meet with fellow members of the Jesuit community at the Archbishop's residence. He will then meet with a delegation of indigenous peoples living in Quebec at the Archbishop's residence around 1045 Eastern Time and that will be brought to you live. someone handing the Holy Father a letter there as he makes his way back down the aisle. And I invite you to visit the Vatican News web portal, our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube accounts where you will find coverage of today's events as well as other Vatican and world news. Our Holy Father making his way still down the aisle in a wheelchair. On behalf of Vatican Media, I'd like to thank our audio technician Adriano Vitali and our coordinator Thaddeus Jones who've made this broadcast possible. And especially to our media partners, Catholic TV, Catholic Faith Network, Shalom World Television Networks, EWTN, Salt and Light Media, Shalom TV, and Sunday Shalom. And we pause here too in silent prayer before the tomb of the very first bishop of Quebec and at that point all of North America, St. Francis de Laval, who was canonized by a decree on April the 3rd, 2014, in honor of the 350th anniversary of the building of this what is now a basilica. Our Holy Father with his hand covering his eyes in silent prayer before the tomb. And to the left we see the relics of the other saints of Canadian origin exposed. And 
can we carry away this meeting of Pope Francis with the bishops and priests and seminarians, consecrated persons and pastoral workers with us, that we too might go forth to proclaim the gospel of joy. Hearing our Holy Father's words that we might also be inspired. I invite you to join us tomorrow when we come back live at 1045 Eastern Time when our Holy Father will meet with dele a delegation of indigenous peoples on his sixth and final day of his 37th apostolic journey to Canada. Laudetur Jesus Christus. Praised be Jesus Christ. Hi everyone, uh, Jenny Conley here, once again the host for Shalom World's live coverage of Walking Together, Pope Francis's apostolic journey to Canada. Once again, I'm here in studio with David Haleva. So the Pope just concluded Vespers at the Cathedral Basilica of Notre Dame in Quebec City. He participated with hundreds of other consecrated bishops, priests, seminarians from across the Quebec diocese. And the prayer service of Vespers began with began and ended with beautiful choral performances and prayers from the St. Michael's Choir from Toronto, which is, which is widely known for their beautiful arrangements and music. So it was, uh, it was a, a beautiful prayer service that included a, a lengthy message from Pope Francis himself, which had a lot, a lot to digest. It was, it was a, a heavy but most eloquent address from the Pope. I thought so. Most certainly, it was most certainly Pope Francis's most theologically heavy mm -hmm. uh, address, and fittingly so, since he is addressing uh, priests, bishops, consecrated those who uh, mm -hmm. dwell on theological matters throughout uh, their day and throughout, uh, I guess, the entirety of their vocation. But he touched on a lot of important points. Uh, first and foremost, I found it particularly interesting on how he mm -hmm. tied the uh, New Testament, or rather within the book of Acts, when it's mentioned that uh, elders were addressed. He, he ties the role of a presbyter, which is uh, the Greek word that's used, but it's translated as elder in, in many modern contexts, to that of the indigenous elders. He made that really uh, mm -hmm. small but interesting connection, which is been a, a gradual theme throughout uh, his visit. Further on, he touched on the need to uh, evangelize in a new way to really meet uh, the world where they're at in this uh, growing rise in secularism. And he presented some interesting perspectives in, in how to evangelize our world, really touching on perhaps being a sign of contradiction by approaching with virtue, to approach less with words, but more so in our actions by displaying charity, meekness, and mercy, which are key figures um, within Pope Francis's disposition and pontificate itself. But I found it very refreshing just to be um, brought to the fore that, that need to perhaps uh, act more so than simply to speak. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point because... There's been discussion, of course, within the news and within many participants, participants in this papal visit about the idea that the idea of the Pope's apology is not enough, which isn't necessarily a negative s statement in the sense that there's been a the talk about the, uh, there's a, a sense of apology and forgiveness, reciprocal forgiveness, which is important, but we're not stopping there. It's not just a moment of this is not just a journey of words and thoughts and prayers. This is also a journey of action. And it's fitting as we're wrapping up. This is the fifth uh, of six days that Pope Francis is here in Canada. And it's fitting that the Pope is emphasizing that theme of action, the call to faith and action, to, to have virtue within ourselves, but also allowing that virtue to flow through our actions and how we're treating one another. And that kind of connects to one thing that stood out to me also in the address that the Pope just gave at the Cathedral Basilica. He was talking about 
Well, actually, it's kind of what you were saying about the, this rise of secularism, the, the, the departure of faith from the mainstream culture in Canada, and the call for a new pastoral imagination, a quote from what he just shared, uh, a new pastoral imagination for how we can communicate the faith. And I thought that's interesting considering the history of assimilation, a, a policy of assimilation, which really squelched and dismin- uh, diminished and even sought to entirely suppress indigenous culture in many a- aspects. And so it kind of calls forth, the, co- calls forth this idea that we need to renew the ways that we communicate and, of course, reject those things from the past which were unimaginative or which were crush- crushing the human spirit rather than compelling the human spirit to flourish. So it's exciting to have this theme of action going forward um, from today's prayer service at the Cathedral Basilica with the, with the Pope. And I thought, too, it was cool. We talked about this earlier, right, about uh, St. Francois de Laval, who was the first bishop of Canada and who was canonized as a saint in 2016 by Pope Francis. And there was a moment, you might have noticed, just right at the end of the live stream where Pope Francis was praying before the relics of St. Francois. Uh, I definitely encourage uh, viewers to check out the biographies online of St. Francois de Laval, the first bishop of Canada, who is known, as the Pope said in his address today, for for railing against those individuals who are abusing indigenous, uh, indigenous people in Canada. St. Francois lived in the 1600s, and that's when he was serving in Canada, and he was an advocate for, for the dignity of all human persons and, and the beauty of indigenous culture when that wasn't a popular sentiment uh, in mainstream or in church culture. So um, to have those stories to be elevated and to be brought into discussion is, is a wonderful thing. I, I just learned about St. Francois like yesterday, so it's a wonderful thing to know about this. Yeah, it's yeah. Very, very fitting, particularly that uh, St. Francois was a missionary bishop yeah. and uh, consistent with the time in New France when missionary priests were coming, particularly from Pope Francis' own order, the Jesuit order, they had a very strict focus on integration with the culture. The uh, Jesuit missionaries of old, particularly we can think of the likes of St. Francis Xavier, Mm -hmm. taking the gospel message to uh, Aboriginal Aboriginal cultures, but doing so very carefully in a means of integrating them in their cultures. And we see he did an excellent job of this in his missionary work in China and India. And we see Mm -hmm. today that those cultures continue to thrive but also thrive in the spirit of the gospel as well. Mm-hmm. And these lessons, the, this disposition in many ways has been forgotten, and it's a challenge and a call to look back at St. Francois as to say a, a missionary ancestor and to really relive that spirit again. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, so well spoken. Yeah, it's good to be reminded of leaving behind any residue of assimilation and moving forward into a healthy and whole form of integration which brings together the best of the human spirit and the beauty of the catholic faith so again pope francis was just at or just probably is still leaving uh, the cathedral basilica of notre dame in quebec city this is his last uh, and only full day in quebec tomorrow he has a couple more meetings including a meeting with former residential school students at the Archbishop of Quebec's residence in Quebec City. Again, that's happening tomorrow morning. And then afterwards, the Pope is going to be bidding farewell to Quebec and will be flying up north to Nunavut, specifically Iqaluit, the capital city of Nunavut, where he'll be meeting with residential school students at that location, as well as offering a public address. So tomorrow is a busy day for the final day of Pope Francis here in Canada. Um, certainly will be worth tuning in to see the unique uh, expressions of indigenous culture and Catholic faith, as well as the stories of the residential school students who are sharing their experiences up north in Nunavut, where the legacy of the residential schools was also very much impactful. So that's tomorrow's itinerary, the last day of Pope Francis in Canada. Once again, we hope you can join us. Myself and David will be commentating the events of tomorrow's visit, uh, as well as live commentary for the Pope's farewell as he flies back to Italy, back to the Vatican tomorrow evening. 
So thank you so much for joining us today for the live stream of Walking Together, Pope Francis' Apostolic Journey to Canada. Be sure to check out this live stream if you want to watch it again on our Shalom World Facebook at shalomworld.org or on Shalom World's YouTube channel. Again, I'm Jenny Conley. This is David Haleva, and we will see you tomorrow. finally over. It's 8 p.m. Time to gather around and enjoy the feast. Shalom.